And you see these haters can't take it Remember all the love I poured How you say that now, this next guest needs no introduction because he's been on our show a few times. And I know that you've expressed appreciation for his journey as not only a, a, a man, but as an author and as a youth advocate. And so it warms my heart to invite Gino Medellos back to today's show to tell us a little bit more about his journey as well as more inspiration behind his book. Gino, we're so happy to have you back on today's program. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I, I'm I'm doing pretty good. You know, I I know that you were just getting over a cold, and and you know you 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 still found the energy to to be on the segment with us today. So we genuinely appreciate your time and 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 your care, <laughs> especially to get to get your story out there. Thank you for that. No problem. Thanks for having me. Now, I do want my audience to just remember a little bit more about your story, uh, because I think it's such a powerful story of your journey through the foster care system. And can you briefly describe for us, Gino, your experience as a foster care youth and how you became an advocate for them? And then how that influenced your decision to become an author? It's, it's, it's a threefold question in one. First, your journey as a foster care youth, and then your advocacy work, and then now you being an author. So the journey itself as a child going through the system, um, I would describe it in a word as horrific. Um, it definitely had challenges that most people can't imagine. Um, even as an adult looking back, it's funny because I just finished the final read through of my book last weekend and I can, it, I, I'm so detached from, from that stage of my life that it almost feels like I'm reading someone else's story. Um, I decided just to, well, I, I think when one of our previous interviews, you had asked me what made me decide to write and I have always loved writing. I, it was instilled in me by my seventh and eighth grade English teacher that writing is a tremendous tool. And it was a chance encounter with Maya Angelou in the early 2000s um, that sort of inspired me to get going on it. I've always believed that I had a powerful story, but it's one thing to believe it and it's another thing to heal from it. So I needed to get to the other side of, of that struggle. Um, and my conversation with Ms. Angelo really helped with that because she was just so giving and so genuine. And it was her that said to me, um, excuse me, fly, uh, that I needed to write it down. Even if I never showed it to anyone, it would help me heal. And she was right. And that's sort of what started this process for me. And it just, it's taken me 20 years. I needed, it's interesting. I was thinking about it last night and I stopped the book, I stopped writing the book right at the point where my mom came into my life. And I never really picked it up again until my mom started to decline her health. And I think that's what I needed. I needed that finality and I needed to get her through the end of her life before I could really delve into the last part of my book, which is predominantly about my time with her and her stability and what she created for me in my life. Wow. Ooh, that is powerful. That is powerful. And through that journey, you also became a very passionate advocate for our young people. Can you tell me a little bit about what motivated you to do that? Because, you know, there are many people who go through the foster care system and, and, and you know, they, they, they successfully do many other things. Um, there are a few that will come back and, and advocate for those other youths. And why have you chosen to do that? I think for me, that's a really good question. And it started sort of organically when I was in college. I reached back out to a private 
foster care organization that I was with to help me pay for it. And I had this impression in my head of what the last social worker that I worked with, with that particular organization had told me. And he basically made me feel, no, he didn't make me feel, he straight up said that they don't support people who are gay and nothing could have been further from the truth. So when I came back, I came back with, to ask for you know them to help pay for college. And I kind of came back with a chip on my shoulder and it was right around the time that the organization that was called the Casey Family Program was starting to really recognize the diversity of foster care children, not in just in race, but also in how they identify. And the director at the time, her name was Carmen, said, sat me down in her office. She said, whatever you think you know, you don't know. And she really encouraged me to talk about it with my experience, what it was like for foster parents um, when I was a child, as far as coming to terms with my sexuality. There are a lot of nuances involved in that when you're when you have your own biological child, let alone a foster child, you don't you're under much more of a microscope. And I took the opportunity to work with the agency and their prospective foster parents because I felt like it was important that they understand one little comment is going to affect a foster child quite differently than it's going to affect their biological child. And that was sort of the typical um, experience that I had growing up was, you know, I was not the most masculine boy and a lot of parents struggled with that. And it, it I just felt this tremendous sense of responsibility to help give back because it was so, I was so fortunate in so many ways that so many kids are not. And as much as I hate to think that it, it was because of my race, it was, and it's not right. Like, I know I had more advantages as a blonde haired, blue eyed white, white kid than my black or Hispanic or Asian counterparts. And that, that to me was an injustice that I felt very strongly that I needed to help try to correct. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for that authenticity. And no doubt your journey through the foster care system and then now going back and giving back. And now you're at this point now in your life where you're nearing the completion of your book. Did the foster care experience shape your des desire to publish this book? And I know it sounds like a, a no brainer question, but I, I want to ask it because I want to hear your thoughts on that? You know, no, which is probably going to surprise you <laughs> and, and my readers. What shaped my decision to write and finish this book were two things, my children and my, my mom. I wanted to leave something behind for my kids because kids don't really know their parents and especially kids that are adopted or you become their legal guardians later in life, they don't know what your journey is. And I felt at the time that I started it, that it was really important that they hear my voice, they hear, they see, they were, that they be able to see what I came from, which might explain some of the decisions that I made at the time when they were growing up. Um, and then also when my mom started to decline, I, I felt it was important to honor her. And it sort of evolved into what it is now, which is hopefully a voice for the kids that are in the system. Because what I'm still seeing happening as I, you know, do interviews and reach out to other organizations is that a lot of their, the system is much better about preparing foster children, foster parents now than it was when I was a kid, but there are still a lot of nuances and a lot of little things that are getting missed. And I just felt this, it was time to, 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 to be that voice for those kids. 
and to leave something for my kids to go, oh, okay, that makes more sense. Wow. So it wasn't my experience I mean, necessarily, it wasn't necessarily my experience as a child, it was more my experience as an adult and what got me through some of the most difficult times of my life. And looking back, I was only able to succeed as an adult because I was able to let go of what happened as a child. And that's really hard for a lot of people to do. And it takes a lot of work, a lot of work. That is so, honest. I'm gonna be honest with you. Your answer did shock me, but in a good way. Cause it, 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 it makes so much sense. And it's, it's for me, it's like listening to you speak. It's one of those aha moments. Like that's like, yeah, that, yeah, that would be the reason why you would want to write a story. Yeah. You want to leave something behind for those that you love, you know, in, in a way that does help them to understand who you are and maybe even helps them to understand who they are and their experiences with you. I mean, that is such a profound thought, Gino. I don't think I've ever heard anybody put it quite that way. And I don't want I want to just gloss over what you stated. That thank you for that. Um, I want to move on to our next question because in your book, you 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 cover a lot pretty quickly. But what key message or themes do you aim to share with the readers? Well, I have two audiences I'm trying to capture at the same time. I'm trying to capture. Well, actually three. I'm trying to capture the attention of the children that are in the system right now. Say, hey, listen, I've been there. See, this is what I went through. Also trying to capture the attention of the people that are caring for them. And I'm also trying to capture the attention of the public at large. Um, so when I tell the story, I, I've kind of tried to remo remove the emotion of it and I try to tell the story matter of factly. It's like, it just, this is the way that it was. Um, and the overall message that I'm hoping to get through to all three of those audiences is perseverance and self believing in yourself. Because that's the hardest part when you, these kids, from the minute they're stripped away from their family they're traumatized. Forget what got them stripped away from their family. That just compounds the, the trauma. And then they're put into a strange environment. So there's another trauma. And it's just one after another, after another, after another. And by the time you land on someone's doorstep or at an institution, you've, you've already been through more trauma than most people can imagine their, their entire life. And I want, especially, especially the kids to understand that might seem right now like you're never going to amount to anything and you're no one really cares but nothing could be further from the truth as an adult in my 50s i can look back and i can see that even the bad foster parents even the people that i read about that were horrific they all touched my life and that's the message i want to get through to prospective foster parents whether you're an emergency foster home, whether you're a, you know, a counselor at an institution, whether you're a therapist, whether you're a social worker, every interaction you have with those kids, you have an, a, you have a, a chance to impact their life and you will impact their life. The things that I can remember are insane. I still remember the name of my first social worker. She's still alive and she lives in the same County as I do. Um, I haven't talked to her, but mm. the power that we as adults have on a child is a lot deeper than I think we realize. And most people realize, you know, we just grow up and we do what we do. We do, we raise our kids and we go about life. And what I've seen lacking so far in a lot of kids in it, whether they're foster adopted or biological is I, I feel sometimes like this generation, and I know our parents said the same thing about us and their parents said the same thing about them, but what I'm seeing is a tremendous lack of appreciation. And what I realized is I was the same way as a young adult, but once you're able to let the appreciation in for the people that helped you get to where you are, then you're able to really live an authentic life. 
having an attitude like, oh, I got here by myself is not going to get you anywhere. You have to let that in. There are just so many different pieces of the story that, and of the reality of the system that it's hard to put it into one little packaged answer. It, 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 I could shoot out in 500 different directions. Perseverance, appreciation, gratitude. Um, those are the strongest messages, I think. Even for me, those are... I, I write about one of the most horrific and abusive foster homes that I had as a teenager. And I still struggle with the direction my life was headed when I came to that family and the direction, and, and I just kept basically made a hard right turn. It was beaten into me and I don't condone that in any way, shape or form. But as a 53 year old man, now I look back and I think, what if I hadn't, where would I have gone? How would I, what would I, and those are lifelong things that you just, I just have to process through. It is what it is. I got through it and it did change me and I did get some good things from it. And I'm choosing as an adult to pick and to pick and pull from the good, not the bad. Of course, I write about all of it, but for me, I carry the good and I find good in all of them. Wow. Wow. That is, that attitude that definitely shows that you've, this is a journey. And I think helping other young ones who share similar experiences um, to find that peace, to find the good in their experiences is, is needed and you're needed. Your story is needed. So thank you for being courageous enough to share it and, and, to, and to lend your voice for our youth. Now, how did your, your own personal experience in the foster care system shape the content of your book? Because obviously your book, you talk about not just foster care, but you know, just your, your life in its entirety. So, but how did your personal experiences in the foster care system shape your book content? Well, I mean, it's a memoir, so it's about me. It's about my experiences. Um, and, you know, there are, there are a lot of people that I'm, not, I'm certainly not the only one. I think what's a little unique about my book is that I grew up in a time in this country um, during the AIDS pandemic and coming to, you know, coming to terms with my sexuality while in the system and while having foster parents that were openly hostile towards gay people. Um, those are things that foster parents don't realize have an impact on the children they're caring for. And so when I write the book, when I wrote the book, I wrote the book to tell that part of the story, it's sort of a, it's not, not just a coming of age story. It's not just a story about abuse, but it's also a story about discovering who I was and finding my voice. And there are a lot of pieces to that. Um, and thankfully I just had a strong constitution, I guess. And once I realized I was gay, that was it. It wasn't my problem anymore with everybody else's. Actually, it really wasn't. I got super lucky. I didn't lose any friends or have anybody walk out of my life. Um, so I guess because it's a memoir and it's about me, that's kind of how it was shaped. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. And so what do you hope readers, particularly foster care use, will take away from reading your book? That there's always hope. Um, that even when you think you're at the darkest and the lowest, there's always hope. And there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. You just have to hold, hold on. Yeah, that's powerful. Thank you. And I, I, I do strongly desire foster care professionals and advocates to, to not only pick up a copy of your book, but to 
to utilize it as a resource in helping our young people. I'm so excited that this book is 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 soon to 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 come into our hands. Um, the, the launch is, is 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 right around the corner. But I do want my readers and my listeners to and my audience, um, as well as your audience, to know where we can pick up a copy of the book when it does come out, or even when you hit the pre-sales. How can we access this book? Where can we go? Well, first, I'm going to put the first kind of a teaser on my website uh, at chicanomaderas.com, and it will be available on my website. It will also be available on Amazon, um, and I haven't really gotten further than that because pretty much nowadays everything's on Amazon. So I'm going to start easy, you know, I'm not going to try to over, hopefully local bookstores will carry it and we'll just see where it goes from there. That's brilliant. Absolutely. Yeah. Amazon is the way to go um, for all publishers today, including those that have been around for over a hundred years. So um, wise choice there. Um, so everybody you can take a look at the links in the description of this show wherever you are listening or watching and you'll be able to click right there to Gino's website to stay updated on on everything that Gino has going on but especially that book Gino before we let you go I want to just again and express my deep appreciation for you taking the time to be with us today but more importantly I'm speaking to our young people and and, and reminding them that they have a voice and that if they just hold on and hope and endure, things are going to get better. So thank, thank you for that, that message. Gino, before we let you go, is there anything else that you would like to share? No, I, um, I'm excited to get the book released. I encourage people to go to my website. Um, you can send me messages directly through my website or on social media. I'd love to hear from you once you've read it. Um, and I encourage you to share it and yeah, and do what you can to make a difference. Beautiful parting words of advice. Thank you so much for that. And Gino, uh, again, you know that you always have a place here on the Joseph Bonner Show and on any, any and all of our programs. We always welcome you as a guest. Please know that you can always come back anytime. I appreciate that. Now, before we let you guys go at home, I do want you to stay tuned and listen to a word from our partners. But before you do that, I want to remind everyone that today's show is brought to you by Bully Interventor, Bully, <laughs> Bully Avengers International. <laughs> Say that three times fast. Um, who continue to fight for our women and children internationally um, through human rights laws, as well as pushing, pushing, pushing for an end to poverty. I want to thank everyone for all, all of your support for all of our programs. Gino, we want to specifically thank you for your support to the Bully Avengers and our, our initiatives there. We appreciate everything that you've done for us as an organization and your support. Um, continue you all to continue to shine, continue to, 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 to believe. And as Gino's uh, parting words of advice to us are to hope. And I think we all can take that with us home tonight and, and meditate on that and, and, and have a better, better day and a better week and hopefully a better year ahead. Gino, again, great interview, and, and, and thank you again for being on today's show. We really appreciate you. Thank you. If it's a true point, we gon' make it. And you see these haters can't take it. Remember all the love I poured. How you say